Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much indeed for joining us uh, at this weekly Greater Manchester COVID-19 uh, briefing. Uh, we've just had our emergency committee meeting with uh, the 10 leaders and uh, other senior officials in Greater Manchester, and we want to uh, uh, update you uh, on what was discussed, and in particular, a significant development around uh, publication of more localised data, which Sir Richard will take you through in a minute. So I am joined today by uh, Sir Richard Lees, um, Leeds on Health for Greater Manchester, uh, by Professor Kate Ardern, who is the lead Director of Public Health for Greater Manchester, Councillor Elise Wilson, who leads uh, on economy and business. Uh, and I'll hand over to Sir Richard without any further ado. On uh, mute, Richard. Thanks, Andy. And, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, we had a, a couple of um, big items on this morning's emergency committee agenda, which I, I, th I think relate very directly to the question of the day. Uh, one is the, the COVID-19 contact tracing in Greater Manchester medium term plan. Uh, the second is the COVID-19 management plan, how we control outbreaks. Uh, um, I think today, probably, uh, all of the uh, 10 districts have published their own local outbreak management plan or published an executive summary of that, and those have all been submitted to uh, government. And uh, Kate Arden will say a little bit more about those uh, in a minute, but those really are how we are going to ensure that we do keep COVID-19 under control in Greater Manchester uh, over the next few months. In previous uh, press conferences, we've given you a lot of statistics about uh, Pillar 1 positive tests, care home statistics, hospital admissions, number of ICU beds occupied, mortality stats. Uh, we're not going to do that today and we are going to move to a different uh, statistical base, uh, really one that we think is more consistent and more reliable. I have to say we still do have all of those indicators and I can say that they are all going in the uh, right direction. But what we're going to start talking about in future now that we have the results of both Pillar 1, the locally done testing, and Pillar 2, part of the national scheme, and we can put that together, then what we're going to start talking about is the comparisons of number, numbers of positive tests per 100,000 people. It's going forward, I think that will give us a far more consistent base for being able to compare how we're doing one week uh, or even one day to the next, actually, in, in terms of some of this data. Uh, we've talked about a lot about the quality and quantity of data that is available to us. It's still not perfect, but it is getting better almost by the day. And I think we now have a, a very realistic and practical dialogue with the um, National Contact Tracing uh, Task Force, which is leading to us really getting all the data that we need. The last bit is well, it's a bit more than just postcode data, but the last bit is postcode uh, data. But we do expect that in uh, days rather than weeks so that we then get the uh, full picture. Clearly, uh, Leicester has got uh, everybody uh, looking about what, what is happening uh, elsewhere. And if you look at Public Health England uh, stats, it would appear that uh, there are a couple of the uh, districts in Greater Manchester that that uh, might seem to be next in line. So in, in the press release that uh, that goes alongside this conference, we're publishing the stats that uh, ought to give some reassurance to people in uh, Greater Manchester. And they're all based on uh, the number of positive cases per 100,000 people. So uh, if we look, and this, this is looking at the last week's stats, Leicester, which with a population of uh, 350,000 people, uh, but their stats were 135 positive cases per 100,000 people. Uh, the Greater Manchester stat was 13.3 uh, per 100,000 people. Uh, but that ranges, so I won't go through every one, they are in the, 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 uh, the, the press release we've issued. Uh, the, at one end, it's 28.8%, which is uh, Rochdale going right down to Trafford, which is 3.4. Uh, percent. But even if you take that worst case of, Roch of Rochdale, that means it's less than a quarter of the rate that you, you see in Leicester. Similarly, if you look at hospital admissions for uh, COVID-19, compare Greater Manchester with Leicester, uh, their 
hospital admission rate is eight times that we see in Greater Manchester. So uh, whilst we might appear to be close, uh, we're actually a long, long uh, way from the position Leicester's in. And unlike Leicester, where the rate of uh, positive tests has been increasing across Greater Manchester, our rate is continuing to uh, go down. Uh, does that mean we can all breathe a sigh of relief and relax? Well, not quite. Um, if you compare the Leicester's stats four weeks ago, they look very similar to Manchester's stats. Theirs have got worse, ours have got uh, uh, got better. And we know that unless we continue to do the right things and uh, testing and tracing is part of doing the right things, uh, then we could go in the wrong direction. And, and again, it's something that Kate will talk about is that we're continuing to give that advice to people about how we should behave in order to keep ourselves safe and to be able to keep everybody else safe. And I think that probably is a point where I'll hand over to Kate. Thank you, Sir Richard, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Sir Richard says, our figures are you know give some cause for reassurance in terms of the fact that they are falling but we must maintain our vigilance and i think it you know thanks to most people for sticking to our public health advice we're also seeing more testing and people who are asked to self-isolate are doing so so that compliance with testing and track and trace really important particularly as our new uh, uh, local uh, tier one system for contact tracing has now been up and running for the last two and a half weeks and is working really well in terms of its relationship with the national system and also across all 10 boroughs so the hard work that we're undertaking to contain any outbreak is helping the greater manchester figures to continue to decline However, we must, as Sir Richard rightly says, maintain our vigilance. And I think this is particularly important as we get up to the weekend and beyond as lockdown starts to ease uh, across other parts of the economy. So we now have more access, of course, to the pillar two testing. So we are increasingly able to see where local infections are and make sure that they are kept under control. So we have, uh, uh, for example, a, a, established an expert group in Greater Manchester, uh, which includes academics, clinicians and epidemiologists to help us focus testing where it's most needed. And that links to our contact tracing system. We're also undertaking work to understand the lessons from Le Leicester and from our colleagues in Kirklees, particularly around understanding where we might have slightly higher risk uh, settings. So for example, our care homes or indeed certain factory settings. And we are, using that to make sure we're linking to best international and national evidence in order to direct our resources appropriately. So in order to help reduce the spread of infection in Greater Manchester, save lives and of course reduce the risk of any local lockdown, I'm asking people in Greater Manchester to continue to stick to the public health advice, which is stay at home as much as possible, limit your contact with other people, make sure you're washing your hands regularly, keep two metre distance from anyone other than those who you live with or are in a support bubble with, meet up with other people outside only in groups of no more than six people from different households, wear a face cover on public transport and in enclosed places, for example, in some shops, you will need to wear a face mask. Self-isolate and get a test immediately if you experience any symptoms of coronavirus, and that can start off as a loss of taste or smell, and obviously a persistent new cough and raised temperature. If you test positive, please help us uh, by engaging with the uh, contact tracing uh, service. Trace everyone you've been in contact with since your symptoms started, uh, particularly in, in the previous 48 hours, and stay at home if you're told to do so by the NHS test and trace system if you've been close to someone who's infected. So we have all of that advice uh, on the uh, Together GM uh, organisation website as well, which is www.togethergm.org. Uh, please do follow that advice. Keep vigilant. It's really important because, as Sir Richard said, Leicester was doing quite well four weeks ago. It's now it's now obviously got into a more difficult situation. We must keep vigilant and we must keep GM safe. 
Thank you. Oh. There we go. Sorry, getting the mute button right. So, um, yeah, these figures are really welcome to see that actually things aren't uh, are going in the right direction in Greater Manchester. And um, obviously, as the um, government are moving us into the next phase and easing of lockdown. Uh, that means that this weekend we could uh, be seeing some of our hospitality and cultural sector opening up. Um, and in Greater Manchester, we're absolutely passionate about our hospitality and cultural sector. It represents a nine billion pound economy to us here in Greater Manchester and supports over 105 thousand jobs um, so it has a massive impact on our communities and and in lots and lots of ways I suppose I'd consider it uh, the soul of our place you know um, and the thing that makes us different um, now COVID-19 uh, has had a disproportionate impact on this sector and even though some businesses will be able to open from Saturday there are many that are not still not going to be able to open um, we are thinking uh, theatres for example nightclubs music venues and that doesn't just impact on those businesses and those organisations but the many people uh, working in in that sector and the artists themselves often who are freelance or self-employed uh, as well and um, that makes for an uncertain landscape for them and we need very much from government an intelligent uh, new version or revision as shall I say to the furlough scheme and um, to really um, uh, be sector specific and support um, those industries um, through this really really difficult time because even those who are opening are not completely out of the woods it is still going to be incredibly difficult um, so I can say uh, today that through the Great Manchester Business Growth Hub we are uh, providing lots of advice and support to those businesses who are uh, thinking of opening or who are opening from the weekend um, support with things like risk assessments and sector specific help we have also asked for uh, Marketing Manchester and we're going to start a new uh, tailored campaign marketing campaign to support our, our efforts and, and we're going to start with really local really local stuff so that we know what's going on near you um, and how you can be uh, going out enjoying uh, enjoying yourselves supporting these local businesses but very much uh, in line with what was said earlier and um, staying safe and keeping safe and keeping in line with those guidelines and um, now many all the local authorities in Greater Manchester are working really hard um, with their businesses in their local areas to support the reopening of that um, uh, but what I would like to be able to say now is that I'm um, hoping with the delay from government, we were hoping from government to see some adjustments around licensing potentially um, for this sector and um, to help with the opening, help with the social distancing um, and really make sure that these businesses remain viable. And um, that's been delayed. So what I'm hoping to be able to do is before the end of this week, ahead of the opening on Saturday um, of some of these uh, businesses within this sector, be able to bring a coordinated uh, licensing package of help uh, forward with in the current regulations and guidelines. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Elise. Uh, thanks, Kate. Thanks uh, to Richard as well. Uh, for me, then, just to uh, to, to summarise, um, colleagues in the media will recall uh, that I did a joint uh, press briefing with uh, the mayor of the Liverpool City region, Steve Rotherham, when we had news that the R number had gone above uh, one in the northwest. Uh, uh, two to three weeks ago and one of the calls we made on that day was uh, for more localised information to be available and we pressed uh, hard for that uh, and Greater Manchester was kept on at that and I'm pleased that finally we've been able to uh, put the data together from pillar one and pillar two as Sir Richard said and finally we can put this picture out uh, today uh, which I hope will be um, will be a help uh, to the Greater Manchester public. That's what I'm trying to do here, to give people information that can be used uh, to, to protect uh, themselves and their, their families and their communities. Uh, and I think this release of information today in, in the first meaningful way enables people to see, uh, to see what's uh, going on. Obviously at the moment we don't know 
how the government is approaching uh, intervention uh, with other local areas. But the figures Sir Richard gave obviously use the the the, uh, the indicator that the health secretary used around cases per hundred thousand. So for now, we'll be using that that same uh, test uh, going forward. And while we can't rule out what will happen here and uh, whether cases may turn in the other direction again, I can say today that we will be doing everything possible here to stay ahead of this virus, uh, to bear down upon it and to minimise the likelihood that we will find ourselves in a position where there could be any form of local lockdown. We can't rule it out, but we are going to be doing everything that uh, we can to prevent it. That's why we've agreed the uh, Greater Manchester Outbreak Management Plan today, uh, which sets out a series of measures for how we're going to do that alongside publishing this more uh, localised information. While, as colleagues have said, the picture is moving in the right uh, direction uh, and is, is moving in the right direction, I must say, in, in pretty much all of our boroughs, certainly nine out of ten, and in, in the other case, uh, we think also uh, moving in that, that same direction. There is still, nevertheless, uh, uh, a lot of this virus in circulation. Uh, over the last seven days, on the latest figures, I have 377 uh, new cases. So people do have to be vigilant, as Professor Arden said. We, we have to ensure that people look at the position in their own borough and then think again about that public health messaging. And in some ways, the localised information, I think, helps people reconnect with the public health messaging that Kate gave. And I would certainly ask them to do that, particularly in advance of this weekend, as Elise was was saying. So, of course, we are about to see uh, the reopening of, of pubs uh, and restaurants. Uh, but our message today uh, to the public is to, to use those new opportunities with great with great caution uh, where possible to stay uh, to stay uh, local. Um, and that's the message from us very much uh, going into the uh, going into the weekend. Greater Manchester Police will have a specific operation in hand. They have uh, cancelled rest days uh, for a large number of officers so that we can once again run a particular um, uh, operation with regard to preventing uh, illegal raves. And we have a, a more specialised surveillance function in place there and we're grateful to the public for the intelligence that they're feeding into that. We've been able to stop a number of raves last weekend and the weekend before, and we are building on that, that success and that operation will be in place again, as well as having a police presence in our towns and cities. Not a heavy handed presence in the background, but there should it be needed. But we do appeal to the public uh, to uh, be cautious, uh, be sensible, uh, and look out for each other. This is still a very serious public health crisis that we find ourselves in and people should approach the weekend with that first in mind uh, as, as they seek to um, perhaps return to towns and the, the city uh, centre. Um, one thing just to mention before that is of course a, a significant uh, match taking place in Greater Manchester tomorrow uh, between Manchester City and Liverpool. I um, want to re-emphasise the message that's been given from various quarters, not least from the, the manager of Liverpool Football Club, that there is no point whatsoever in people travelling to this uh, to this game uh, from, from either side, actually, but certainly not uh, from, from Liverpool. Um, there will be no access to the ground uh, and therefore the team coaches, because, of course, the Etihad has a perimeter fence. There will be no licensed premises uh, open. Uh, we will not um, want to see any gatherings uh, and I would just ask people to take that message uh, message on board and to enjoy the match uh, from home. I'll finish uh, just by saying something in addition to Elise's points about uh, laying the foundations for recovery and supporting our important industries. And I want to say to the government that we were grateful for confirmation yesterday of, of funding uh, to support recovery in Greater Manchester. £81 million of funding uh, to clean up and bring forward brownfield sites uh, for uh, development, which is very much in line with the brownfield first policy that we are operating in Greater Manchester. Uh, Councillor Wilson, the leader of Stockport, has been behind the, de the development, persuading me to create the first mayoral development corporation in the country in Stockport Town Centre which uh, will deliver 3,500 homes. And we want to see, of course, similar developments of affordable housing 
in, in other boroughs and the 81 million pounds that we were given yesterday will, will help with that alongside the 54 million pounds that we've had confirmation of today for shovel ready uh, projects so uh, these are very welcome uh, developments we're grateful to the government but i do point out to them though that you know leveling up can't just be about concrete and steel it has to be about skin and bone it has to be about helping people now people who've been through a really tough uh, time and people perhaps who are at risk of redundancy uh, young people who've lost their apprenticeships and looking ahead to the chancellor's statement uh, in uh, the next few days we, we would ask him to uh, think about a young person's guarantee of the kind we've spoken about here making sure there is something in place uh, for all young people uh, this year a job to go to or a, or a training opportunity we do ask for uh, support for uh, sectors where they may face a longer wait before they can come back to work so access to a, a form of the furlough scheme for hospitality for our cultural sector as has been uh, said and more more funding to support conversion courses uh, helping people retrain so that they can be part of the green ep economy going forward and this is a big moment it seems to us to um, to accelerate uh, investment in the green uh, economy and those are the ideas that we've put to the chancellor ahead of his uh, statement and uh, we hope very much uh, alongside the welcome news we've had yesterday that he will take these on board so ross i'm going to leave it there and i'm going to hand over to you to take us through the questions thank you very much um, we've got a number of questions uh, from a lot of colleagues uh, so thank you uh, for sending them in we'll start with dave guest and a question for andy uh, given Leicester's experience, are there currently any parts of Greater Manchester which you believe may be in imminent danger of a Leicester style lockdown? Once you've finished, Andy, I'll go to Kate on a sub, uh, supplementary. Uh, and maybe Richard as well might want to say something, uh, Ross. Um, no, given what Richard uh, said, you know, the, the, the gap between what's happening here and what appears to have been happening in Leicester is pretty uh, wide. Um, so no is the answer to the question, but of course I'm not complacent. The picture can change quite quickly. Um, so, you know, we're not ruling out that we won't be in a, a similar situation. But as I said, you know, at least in nine of the ten boroughs, probably in ten out of ten, the number of new cases has been coming down. So we're going in the opposite, we're going in the right direction, which is the opposite direction uh, to, to Leicester. The only caveat I'd put on it is we don't yet know what the government's thresholds are, are for intervention. You know, what, what is the test? What is the trigger point for the government saying, oh, we need to intervene? Now, we, we would never want to get to that point anyway, because we want to be on top of things ourselves. And we would want to be obviously asking buildings to close if they were presenting a, a particular uh, risk with regard to an outbreak. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't even want that situation to arise, because as I've always said, we, we see local lockdowns as presenting a, a huge number of difficulties. Uh, but we are seeking clarification from the government as to what those thresholds are for when they would intervene. It, it seems to be unclear in the case of, of Leicester. It was based largely on the cases per 100,000 population, which kind of we've given today as a comparator with, with Leicester. But it would help everywhere, I think, if the government were to be to be clearer uh, with, uh, with all um, local areas as to uh, how things would escalate up to the national level. Thanks, Andy. Um, I see Richard wants to come in on that point. I'll just uh, perhaps give a few more uh, stats to demonstrate that point. We're going in the right right direction, but also to demonstrate, as uh, Kate's talked about, the, uh, the risks that uh, everywhere potentially face as well as the virus is still about. And, uh, what I'm going to give you, these are a comparison between the city of Manchester and uh, Leicester, and it's the seven day rolling average for Manchester and Leicester on pillar two positive cases. That's what I'm uh, com uh, comparing. Uh, 1st of June, Leicester was 29, and in successive weeks it went to 48, 65, 85, 86, increasing every week. At that starting point, Manchester was 19 and it's now 12. And that, that's, I think, the point we're making is that four weeks ago we started in not a dissimilar position. Uh, Manchester has uh, improved over that period of time. 
uh, Leicester has got sig uh, its position has significantly worsened. Now, uh, from what we do know, if I had the, the same stats for any of the districts in Greater Manchester, it would be very, very similar. They will all show an improvement over that four week period of time as against Leicester's worsening of their situation. Nothing to be complacent about, but we do have I think, the evidence that uh, even in those areas that seem to have the highest rate of cases, they're nowhere near Leicester and they're going in the right direction. Thanks very much, uh, Richard. Uh, I'm going to go to Kate, uh, a supplementary question from Dave. Uh, last month, Andy and Steve called for better localised information to be provided to directors of public health to help them identify specific flare ups and decide on the best way to tackle those flare ups. Are you now getting that information in a timely manner? And if locking down a region or city isn't the best option, what is? Thank you, Dave, uh, and I, I can assure you that Wigan's figures are improving, knowing you're a Wiganer too. Um, in, in answer to that, we are get, our, our data is improving on a day by day basis. Uh, we do probably need much more real time data flowing into our system, and that is what we're working on with Public Health England colleagues over the next uh, few uh, days and weeks to make sure we have timely, accurate information uh, at a patient identifiable data flowing into our contact tracing system. So we are getting much better data and we uh, are getting the pillar two data activity, which is really welcome. And that enables us to do the rate per 100,000 of new infections, which we weren't able to do previously. So that's an improvement and we are improving our data all the time. And that's because of the unique relationship we have with Public Health England uh, in Greater Manchester by having an integrated uh, tier one contact tracing hub. And the answer to the second part of your question is very much around getting ahead of the curve, making sure we've identified potential risk areas. So, for example, the uh, meatpacking factories that we're working with pro very proactively across Greater Manchester, learning from the experience in Kirklees and Anglesey, very important to work, work with uh, organisations or areas where we know there are potential risks so that we actually can work with them on infection prevention control, making the workplace safe, improving access of, to information for staff and that's part of the work of the contact tracing hub. We're also working very closely across Greater Manchester to understand and clamp down on any immediate outbreaks. So for example, you know, we've been dealing with a few outbreaks uh, across uh, in, in, in a school, in, in uh, for example, in primary care, being able to get on top of that really quickly, get the right information out, get make sure that contacts are self-isolating and getting the right advice. And that's the advantage of being able to work across our 10 boroughs. So the, uh, co the COVID-19 management plan that we've published today sets all of that out and also enables us to look, working very closely with our partners in the NHS, to deploy things like mobile testing units across Greater Manchester to support outbreak management uh, so that we can respond very quickly to any change in trends and get ahead of the curve and dynamically manage those outbreaks. So I think we're in a fortunate position to be able to do that and that's the benefits of working across the 10 boroughs. Thanks very much, Kate. I'm going to go straight to a question uh, from Siobhan McGee at uh, Broch Valley Radio for Andy. Um, with bars and restaurants reopening this weekend, do you see this impacting on local COVID figures uh, and the possibility of a local lockdown? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Siobhan. Um, well, I guess the answer to your question is it's obviously more likely to make the figures move back up again than back down once you're easing, easing the lockdown. Uh, the reason uh, the figures have been coming down in Greater Manchester is because the Greater Manchester public has overwhelmingly been uh, following the advice and we're grateful to them for that. But obviously the easing of restrictions uh, presents risks. And to answer your question very directly, it will depend, of course, won't it, on the extent to which behaviour uh, changes. Um, you know, social distancing, as uh, Professor R. Denzel, is still very much the advice you know it's two meters um unless you've got a face mask or uh, a visor or uh, you're in some way separated from, from the person you're near so you know people need to to, to be very very uh, cautious um and you know we'll be monitoring things uh, very carefully i say I, I do not want 
Greater Manchester to be in the position where we have a local lockdown imposed. And I will do whatever I can uh, to, uh, to push that prospect away. I'll, I'm doing this today with Sir Richard to put information in the hands of the Greater Manchester public, Greater Manchester businesses, so they can see the real picture on the ground and they can then, we trust in their judgment then, to take the right steps to keep everybody, themselves safe and keep everybody safe. That's why we're doing this today. We want to be on the front foot here and uh, alongside the measures Kate has just mentioned with the, the 10 individual outbreak management plans and the, the GM level one, you know, we think we're putting in place an infrastructure here alongside the timely surveillance and information that will, that will minimise any prospect that we will get to that position. Uh, but of course, we, we, we can't say there won't be, but you know, there's no complacency here. Uh, what uh, whatsoever. So, you know, we need the public to work with us is, is the answer. You know, please, if you are going out this weekend, we want you to enjoy yourself, support our local economy, as Elise said, but do it in the right way. Keep yourself safe and at all times think about the other people around you. Thanks very much, Andy. Ed, staying with you, question from Andy Smith uh, from Wish FM. Are towns and cities in Greater Manchester prepared to implement local lockdowns and looking at lessons learned from Leicester? But also, what are your thoughts on the situation at Wigan Athletic? And are you concerned that uh, uh, clubs in the North West could end up in a similar situation? Uh, do they need more support? And I'll bring in Kate after that. I think the answer on the first question is as prepared as we can be. Um, you know, I think like Leicester, we are in a position where we haven't been given that much information as to how these things will work in practice. Um, uh, but obviously, as much as we can be, we are uh, in a position of preparedness and we have been monitoring the data. And you know, we're, we're pleased that the figures you're having reported to you today are going in the right direction. And that's not by accident. You know, we've been following this as much as we can all the way through this. We've had these regular press briefings all the way through because we've tried to be on the front foot all the way through. Uh, so we're as pre prepared as we can be. Um, but I think the concept of a local lockdown is a much more complicated business in Greater Manchester than perhaps in Leicester, where you have one local authority that covers pretty much the entire entirety of the city beyond a couple of suburbs. You know, here we've got 10 interlocking boroughs um, and, you know, we we have always said we would find any notion of a local lockdown a very uh, a very complicated business and something we want we want to avoid. Um, I think the government hasn't fully answered all the implications of a local lockdown. What is the support for businesses in the areas? Because, you know, we, we see that the government knew the figures were rising in Leicester, even when they said people were free to open on the 4th of July. So surely it follows there should be some compensation for businesses who've made preparations to open, who now can't. Will there be ongoing access to the furlough scheme? And one big, I think, missing piece in this jigsaw, and this is a national point, where's the help for people to self-isolate if they are in jobs where they won't be paid should they seek to do that? I think that's a real problem that still needs to be addressed because there are too many people here in Greater Manchester who just might find they are unable to stop work because the funds won't be there to support them and their families. And I think the government needs a better answer on that uh, particular issue. With regard to Wigan Athletic, obviously I've seen the news today and you know, as, as a club very local to me here and I have a lot of friends at Wigan Athletic and I have a huge regard for the club. Um, for. Uh, all of the people um, who, who I know uh, care deeply about about the club. Uh, you know, I, I've looked, I've heard what the administrator has said. It doesn't seem to be, uh, let's say, a, a, a dire situation. There is some grounds for hope that the finances can be sorted out. I think the bigger point is, is the point. Lower league football clubs are going to really struggle in the same way that hospitality and the cultural sector are going to struggle. So are football clubs. And I think the time is coming where we need the Premier League uh, to step forward, perhaps working with the government to create a solidarity fund uh, to protect lower league football clubs. Otherwise, we see a real risk of some of them uh, going to the wall. We all felt the trauma of what happened to Bury uh, last year, and I don't want to see the same thing happen to any uh, professional football club in Greater Manchester. Uh, you know, so we'll do what we can to support uh, our good friends at Wigan, um, but I think the game has to take responsibility of this situation now. Kate, I don't know if you'd anything to add um, on that point. 
just to just to add to, uh, to the the first part of the question, uh, we have uh, very well established outbreak control plans which form part of each borough's COVID-19 management plan and of course the Greater Manchester plan and we are well versed in actually managing outbreaks of communicable disease. This is uh, public health bread and butter. So in a sense what we've done is to take those well tried and uh, tested plans and to utilise them for COVID-19. Really important to uh, build on the excellent work we already have uh, around uh, working with Public Health England and of course working very closely in a multi-agency response to outbreaks. So that is our absolute first line of response and that is where Greater Manchester's strength is and uh, we have included the ability obviously within the plan in terms of escalation to a wider Greater Manchester response so calling on mutual aid between the boroughs being able able to deploy resources to support individual boroughs who are managing outbreaks and we've now got plenty of experience of doing that so it's actually building on that tried and tested approach and testing out our plans and revising them as we get more uh, evidence around COVID-19 and we learn from the experiences of other places. Thanks Kate. Uh, a question uh, I'm going to put to Richard in the first instance from uh, Kevin Fitzpatrick at Radio Manchester. Downing Street has said that Public Health England has shared local data uh, with the council since April. Uh, also uh, said that since the 11th of June, an operational dashboard has been made available by NHS Digital, which included counts of local tests, total positive cases and test and trace data to give local authorities a clear picture of the statistics in their areas. Is this the case in your view? And if so, what other information did you need that you haven't had? Uh, well, uh, again, I've been saying on a regular basis that uh, uh, from week to week we do occasionally get new data uh, sources and uh, all of them have come relatively uh, late and it's only two weeks now since we've had um, Pillar 2 testing data available to us. I think last week was the first week that we were able to uh, re report on that. So I think the evidence of when We've reported on stuff when we've got it and clearly we've been saying quite regularly that there has been data that we have not had available to us. Um, we are already, by the way, managing uh, outbreaks. Part of our dashboard now is the, the number of outbreaks uh, that we are managing. I think it's only around about uh, 17 uh, outside of hospital or care home uh, settings, but nobody's noticed. And I think that's a, a measure of the effectiveness that nobody has uh, uh, notice that we are man managing those but uh, once we move away from hospitals and care homes which are relatively straight uh, straightforward then we do potentially get into workplaces into particular neighborhoods and so on and some of the data that we haven't got uh, uh, relates to inequalities we don't have sex we don't ha have ethnicity and we know there is a higher risk for some communities and other communities <laughs> and we, we don't have occupation we don't have age and again age in terms of risk factor is probably the single biggest risk factor with this but the most important bit of data we don't have as yet is postcode so we might know how many people there are in a local authority area we don't know where they are in that local authority area and clearly if you've got 10 cases and they're spread all over Wigan then it says one thing. If you've got 10 cases and they're all in the same street, it says another thing uh, entirely. We still don't have that data. Now, we are, we have been promised it. We are expecting it in days rather than within uh, weeks at the moment, but that is the most important piece of data that we still need. Thanks, um, Andy, unless you Anything you want to come in on, on that point, we'll move on. Fantastic. Go to you, uh, Andy. Um, Joseph from the Bolton News and Berry Times. Uh, a few weeks ago, you said uh, you're not in favour of local lockdowns and wanted to work with communities instead. Is that still the case? And who would make that decision? Would it be local authorities, GM or the government? Thanks, uh, Joseph. The, the policies we're outlining to you today are, are very much, uh, as I see it, the, uh, the alternative. Local lockdowns are, are, a, are a failure of other interventions. They're the last thing that you do when everything else has failed. And what we're giving to you today is the everything else, as Greater Manchester sees it. 
you know, what we can do to keep a grip on this virus. The work with Communities Point is the publication for the first time of meaningful localised data. You know, that is intended to empower communities uh, to uh, make the right decisions, to look after themselves, to, to, to reconnect with the public health messaging. So, you know, that's the first step of working with communities. But in the plan that we're publishing uh, today alongside the 10 districts, we're also looking at what further measures we could do, as Kate said, identifying higher risk workplaces and then being ready to, to, to manage any issues that, that may arise there, improving the contact tracing system. And the leaders today have endorsed proposals to recruit our own workforce uh, to create a high quality, highly trained uh, contact tracing team uh, in um, contact tracing team in Greater Manchester. So, you know, everything we're doing, Joseph, is about avoiding that. For me, that's that's failure. That's the end of the line. And as I say, I, I still see that being fraught with difficulties. And I'm, I'm afraid, you know, maybe people in Leicester are going to experience that over over the coming fortnight. It's my job, alongside Sir Richard and Elise, uh, as as leaders in Greater Manchester, to do everything we possibly can to prevent that happening. And that is what we've agreed uh, agreed today. And it's a Greater Manchester plan, uh, which I think is 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 at the leading edge of what's going on at a local level around the country. In terms of decision making, very quickly, Ross, I think it's still unclear, isn't it? Sorry, that this point about thresholds. You know, what, what our plan kind of involves is obviously districts have the primary responsibility. The plan allows them to escalate issues to the GM level so that we can support districts in managing those issues. What is still not clear is where national level uh, intervention would take place. What's the trigger point for that? And that is still unclear. But what I want to do, and we had this discussion this morning, is take decisions ourselves to close down uh, problematic uh, uh, buildings or workplaces, uh, you know, rather than waiting for others to come in and do it for us. And that's the spirit of this Greater Manchester plan that we've uh, we've agreed today. Thanks, Andy. Um, it's a question from Louise Martin at BBC News. Uh, probably one we want to bring Kay and maybe Richard in on as well. But how are we making sure that settings such as factories uh, and warehouses are sticking to social distancing rules? So we'll go to Andy in the first instance um, and then uh, to Kate. It's a very good question, Louise. And, and I would answer it by going back to what happened when lockdown was first implemented because a lot of businesses were allowed to carry on working because they were businesses where people couldn't work from home. So obviously you might remember there was lots of reports of, of warehouses and um, uh, distribution facilities, um, manufacturing facilities still working and, and particularly construction sites as well. And it's difficult because in my view, the Public Health England advice was too vague. It said stick to two metres where possible. Um, and consequently, we had a, I asked people to complain if they were worried about their workplace and we, we, we received a huge number of complaints. And I don't think the government has ever got a firm enough grip on, on this issue. And the, the health and safety executive, I don't think, has been visible enough throughout this, um, this, this crisis. So we have a process in place. We set up a group at the GM level whereby complaints could be referred to Greater Manchester Police and trading standards uh, and investigations were made and will be made. Um, but it is vague when it comes to the national guidance and it allows too many sort of get out clauses, I would say, uh, for, for, for companies. So, you know, we would want to send that message out again. You know, we, we must stick to two metre social distancing in the workplace, um, sanitizer uh, availability, washing of hands, um, wearing of face masks and other PPE. You know, th this, everyone needs to use Leicester as a wake up call. And that means individual businesses working in our region as well. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I don't know if Kate or Sir Richard want to come in on this one or move on. Oh, uh, and go to, yep. uh, go to Kate and then go to Elise. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, we've been wor working very closely with the growth company and with business leaders across Greater Manchester. So we have written out to all businesses through the growth company, uh, explaining the new track and trace system and actually getting active engagement. Uh, so that's through the uh, GM uh, hub and engagement with the GM system. But at a local level, all of our local plans involve business engagement and support. So that's support around infection prevention control. I've done webinars, for example, with our, with our business leaders across uh, Greater Manchester as well to support that. Uh, and the plans at a local level involve our trading standards and our business engagement groups across the local authorities who have those existing trusted relationships and can get in there and actually have uh, the conversations around making workplaces COVID safe. So, yeah, that is re a really key part of our strategy, both at a GM level and within individual boroughs. Thanks. Go to Richard and then I'll go to Lise. The only, the only thing I wanted to say is that uh, for, uh, for all local authorities that any information or complaints we have about particular premises that might not be complying with PA, uh, Public Health England's guidelines, all of them are visited and actually in virtually every case when they have been visited we find that they are complying but if they aren't uh, yes we, we don't have powers of compulsion but they're given very clear advice about what it is that they need to do. Thanks, Richard. I'll go to Lise. I just uh, want to add on that is that actually um, the majority of places that are open or want to be open or remain open or had to stay open are actually wanting to do this right and wanting to get it right and wanting to protect their staff and their customers and, and the reason for that is is a second peak or a local lockdown is not good for business and it is not in their interest and they don't necessarily want all their staff poorly and off sick so I'd say a lot of people People are supportive. Uh, a lot of businesses are really engaging in what we do. And through the growth company, we have put an awful lot of work into putting that support in place. Um, but I would say, whilst there are elements that maybe one or two that maybe are not. Uh, 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 on board or as slick or as fast as reacting and, and moving and making sure that they are uh, COVID safe, um, the, the, the vast majority are and it is in everybody's interest and it's about us working together with businesses to make it right with our communities um, and really pulling together on that and not uh, and, and that is really the best way forward I think is how we can do it do it together. Thanks, Elise. Um, question for Richard uh, from Victoria Glover at Hits Radio. What's the latest with the Nightingale Hospital in Manchester? Is it still in use for COVID patients? Some others across the country are being repurposed into cancer testing centres. Are there any plans for that here? Uh, at the moment, the Nightingale Hospital is being held in uh, reserve. Uh, it's a commitment to maintain it until uh, next March, because one of the things we have to do is to maintain capacity, particularly through this uh, winter, that will allow both for any potential spike or spikes in COVID-19 cases, but also uh, other uh, epidemics that might strike the uh, country. And obviously, uh, flu, flu epidemics, winter flu is uh, an example of something we have to be very, very uh, wary of. And I have to say that uh, a lot of the measures that we are putting in place to deal with COVID-19 will also allow us to deal with any other epidemic uh, as, as well. So actually, if we do have a flu epidemic, we're far better placed to deal with that than we might have been uh, otherwise. Uh, we are having discussions in Greater Manchester now, though, about uh, whether in the interim that we can use uh, the Nightingale Hospital in uh, other ways. It's still a major concern, which again was reported on uh, to the emergency committee this morning that, that there are still people who ought to be uh, seeing the doctor that, uh, for, for suspected cancer and other areas are simply not uh, coming forward uh, so we do really want to in encourage that but also I mean we've got the capacity to be able to support those people uh, as well so uh, we are looking at Nightingale and, and whether we can use it in that way but bear in mind that we have to be uh, 
very, very careful because uh, if we suddenly need it, we can't actually, if, if we fill it with people, we can't throw them out in order to use for uh, COVID-19. So it, it will have to be a very careful and measured plan. Thanks, Richard. Another one for you from uh, Joseph at the Bolton News. Uh, will the number of cases for local authorities, including Pillar 2 data, be available or will it just be the cases per 100,000 that's shared with the public and the reasoning behind that? Well, <laughs> I would say I, I, I could give you the population of Bolton, if you like, and you can do the sums. But uh, um, uh, look, uh, the thing is about the number of cases per 100,000, it gives a realistic uh, uh, comparison. If you if you take, for example, the number of cases in Manchester population, uh, I think around about 560,000 and compare them with uh, Bury, more, uh, closer to 200,000, you don't get a real comparison. So uh, what we want to do is to use data that gives us a real indication of uh, certainly what conditions are, but also what the direction of uh, travel is. That's why we're using that data. So uh, what we don't want to do as well is use data that actually is misleading. Uh, so if, if we have data that gives false comparisons and that doesn't inform you or the public, it misinforms uh, you and the public. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, a question from uh, for Elise from Nigel Barlow about Manchester. Uh, he says he's hearing a lot about hospitality, uh, but given that this disease is going to be around for a long time and will affect the sector disproportionately for some time, is it not time that we should be looking away from shifting our economic model away from what has always been a precarious, low wage and unpredictable sector? We just need to unmute. Yeah, of course, mute button. Um, so yeah, this I think it's kind of two parts that question for me. So one is hospitality, culture, uh, our visitors economy, uh, the nighttime economy, our sports venues, everything that kind of makes us us is really, really important. And I think really valuable and really part of the soul of a place. And and um, we have um, comparatively uh, one of the largest economies outside London, I think the second largest economy outside London. And, and this is a big deal for us. And we really value our creatives and, and our, and our uh, uh, sports and, and all that cultural stuff that we've got going on. And we enjoy eating out and socialising and, and doing all that. And none of that is a bad thing because it makes a place special. Um, so I would say, no, we don't want to move away from that. But do we want to have um, better jobs? um with um improved um improved conditions for people yeah obviously and very much so so i would say a lot of that is around the work that andy started and, and we've started with uh, leading on around building back better and about what the future could look like and and the work that we're doing through our good employment charter and i think for us then it'll be about how we do that that we can make this sector better better for everybody that's working in it but we have a really robust sector where until this covid crisis came along it was it was growing it was doing well um and and we want to keep that we want to see that continue um we want to enjoy going to the theater and all those other things that we really really enjoy um but we want to be able to do it and we want people to have uh be able to enjoy their work and 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 and, and have better conditions with that and that's what Build Back Better is about and that's the ambition around the Good Employment Charter and um, so I think the future could be really really positive for this for this sector um, but you are right to point out that there has been there has been areas for improvement but it's a very valued sector that brings such a lot to Greater Manchester. Thanks very much Elise. A uh, question for Andy and Kate but Andy first. Uh, from uh, Elizabeth at the Rochdale Observer. Many residents in Rochdale are very concerned to read that the borough's infection rate is the highest in Greater Manchester. Are you confident that measures from GMC together with Rochdale Council will be able to contain COVID-19 in the borough? What steps will GMC be making together with the council to prevent a local lockdown in Rochdale? Well, thanks, uh, Elizabeth. In some ways it's difficult um, to, to get the balance right here, but, but... I don't want to kind of uh, unduly reassure people because obviously there is a risk, but 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 again, look at the gap between Rochdale, which is only just our highest, by the way, and the situation we're seeing in Leicester. That's the issue. Now, I don't want people to take from that, oh, there's no problem then. You know, we're, 
that's not what I'm saying. There is a need to be vigilant, but don't become unduly alarmed. And, you know, there isn't any, as far as I understand it, uh, there is no prospect of any intervention. Uh, but it depends upon how people within the borough uh, kind of behave, particularly going forward uh, with this weekend coming. So it's in our own hands. It's in it's in the hands of the people of Greater Manchester. You know, we're, we're in a, a reasonably good position today compared to other places because, as Sir Richard said, the number of cases has been falling. And that includes Rochdale, by the way. And it's really important for me to, to say that to you. But it may not always stay that way because it's linked to what we do. And, you know, the more breaches there are, obviously, the more risks uh, there are. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm confident in the measures we've put forward and I'm confident. We talked about a, a, an Opal style warning system to put that into everyday language. That's like a, you know, a black alert system, if you like, um, so that we can see and be if, if things are going in a different direction in a particular borough, we can intervene quickly. Uh, and we can raise the alarm quickly before it ever gets to the to the national level. That's that's the base of what we're doing today. And so while I can never say that um, we can prevent um, completely a local lockdown in any of our boroughs, including Rochdale, we we, we have a plan here that is intended to prevent them. Uh, and you know I think we're putting ourselves in the strongest possible position. And I want to pay tribute today to to. Um, but Sir Richard has been pointing out the, the flaws in the data pretty much at every press conference that we've had since this crisis began. So he's made the case for localised data. So has Kate. So has the whole Greater Manchester system. And the fact that the data is now coming out, I think, is largely down to what Greater Manchester has been arguing for since this since this began. So I think we've put ourselves in a position now where we can get ahead of it. And I want to stay ahead of it. But I need the public on my side with that. And we, we need everyone working to support each other. So it's in our own hands. I'd, I'd say this to the public of all of our boroughs. It's in your hands. Listen to the public health advice, follow it closely, and we should avoid any risk of a local lockdown. Thanks. We'll go to Kate uh, and then Richard if he wants to come in. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I know that my colleagues in Rochdale are working incredibly hard in terms of their own plans and I would point out that uh, from the 8th of June they actually launched their walk-in testing centre in the centre of Rochdale so they have been doing a lot of testing in Rochdale too so they are actively looking for positive cases which is a really important part of any good effective plan to manage uh, diseases like COVID-19. So they are doing a lot of work in terms of public engagement and they're targeting their comms and messages to uh, their communities within the borough. So yes, they're actually implementing the COVID-19 management plan. So I've got confidence in the way they are handling that. And of course, we actually uh, are there to wrap around and support should they need us. And that's the way in which we work in Greater Manchester. So if one borough uh, needs support from the rest of us, we are there to help and support their uh, response. They're in, in control of the response, but we are there to support. And I know there's really proactive work going on in Rochdale. And I would reiterate, as the mayor has said, the public health messages are so important around physical distancing, around hand hygiene, around face masks. We can, uh, we are there, we are the people who can actually reduce our own risk from uh, COVID-19. Thanks, Rev. Richard. Uh, you wanted to come in on this one? Perhaps only uh, to give another uh, health warning on, on the data. Inter interpretation is uh, uh, everything. We will see some uh, fluctuations in, in data. I know there's a question later on around uh, uh, Bolton. The Bolton 21.6 figure by the end of next week could be uh, 15, uh, 15 or it could be 25, uh, both of which are not too bad. If it became 105, then it becomes a, 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 a problem because it always dep will depend on not just how many people are tested, but who is tested on uh, uh, any given day, not least because we are now in increasing the number of people who are asymptomatic who are being uh, tested. And clearly, if you only test people with symptoms, you're going to get a higher positive rate. Uh, if you start testing with people who are asymptomatic, it's far more un un unpredictable, really. So uh, uh, small variations are to be expected until we have a vaccine or a cure. 
then there will be some bottoming out when you will have a little bit of ups and, uh, ups and downs. It's just making sure that we are in the trough and not climbing out of the uh, trough. That's, that's where we are at the moment for, uh, for everywhere and everywhere in the right direction. Thanks, Richard. Uh, given the time, uh, I was going to uh, go to uh, colleagues who haven't yet had a chance to ask a question. So apologies to those who've put in supplementaries. I'm going to try and make sure we everyone gets at least one question. So on that basis, I was going to go to uh, Charlotte uh, Wace uh, and one for you, uh, Richard. Uh, the latest figures uh, just published in the PHE Weekly National COVID Report show that the cases have risen in Rochdale uh, to 53.6 uh, per 100,000 and in Oldham to 38.6 cases per 100,000. Are these areas of particular concern? Uh. I, I, I'd be tempted to say if there was one case per 100,000, it would be an area of uh, uh, of concern because clearly what we want to do is to, as far as possible, eliminate the virus. Uh, I've not seen those figures uh, be before, and so I, I'm going to be very wary about making comparisons. But uh, if they show that uh, over the past week that we've uh, been moving in the wrong direction, uh, then clearly that is an area of concern. And what we'd want to do is work with colleagues, uh, public health and council in Rochdale and Oldham uh, to try and understand uh, uh, what what those are. And uh, again, if we know specifically where those cases are, that gives us a better idea of uh, what sort of issues we are we are facing. So yes, it's an, it's a concern and a concern we'll have to look at. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to go to a question from Jen Williams for Andy. Uh, there have been multiple uh, national media outlets reporting in the past few days that Wigan is at risk uh, of a local lockdown based on a list of places that seems to have been circulated. Uh, Kate has already said that the data doesn't bear that out, but it's still being widely, widely shared on social media. I just wondered whether you knew where this list had come from uh, and if you had a message to the people of Wigan. Um. Well, the first thing I'd say, Jan, is to look at the data that we've just issued uh, this afternoon uh, because Wigan uh, is uh, second from bottom of the league table that we've uh, issued this afternoon for uh, positive tests per 100,000 population. I think what has happened is from a very, very low base, Wigan saw a to a, you know, a number of cases, which may look like percentage wise, there have been a big increase, but it was from a very, very low, low number. But I, I think I don't know where the list has come from, but this to get to the heart of what you're asking about, it feels to me as though there's been the briefing at a national level um, about uh, particular places. And Leicester spoke about seeing the name of the city being just put into the public uh, domain, uh, potentially by you know political advisors or whoever in, in, in the Whitehall system. That, that is fundamentally wrong and that needs to stop because you correctly pointed out it can lead to a rumour mill on social media. Some people are becoming very alarmed about that. It's why this data that we've published today is crucial, it's absolutely crucial. So we can have facts and people can judge things for themselves and we're not having nudges and winks to certain journalists and names of places all of a sudden being thrown into a, into a media story. That is the worst of all worlds. That is not any way to handle a public health uh, crisis and that has to to stop actually so we'll be publishing this data in this form on a weekly basis from here on in and if we can improve it we will um, but you know that is what we would say to the public do not my message then to the people of Wigan is don't follow every rumor on social media you know look to information that's published by ourselves or indeed officially by the government um, but, but please don't follow every every rumour. You know, we feel relieved in some ways that today we're finally giving the residents of Greater Manchester something more solid on which to sort of base their um, uh, their, their, their reactions. Uh, and it's taken too long in coming because of the way in which the data has not been shared. But, you know, this briefing and sort of, you know, behind closed doors sort of mentioning of places on lists, that, that really does have to stop. And in effect, in effect, we need to see this data that GM has published for ev published everywhere on, a, on an ongoing basis as frequently as possible. And that will be the best way to, uh, to to help people through this. 
Thanks, Andy. Um, there's a question uh, from Ian Hills at Within Show FM, which I'll put to you first, but it might be one that uh, Sir Richard and Elise's council leaders might want to take. Uh, Ian says that schools are to restart in September as normal without social distancing, uh, and parents are apparently being fight, uh, to be fined for not sending children back to school. And he's asking, is that correct? I, I would say not myself. Uh, I'm going to give you a personal view, uh, but I don't think it is acceptable to find a parent in the middle of a pandemic who is concerned about the health of their child. It, you know, there may be underlying conditions, there may be reasons to be to be concerned. I, I don't think you can find parents. My, in, this is my view in this situation. You can strongly encourage parents to um, uh, to make sure their kids are in school, but, but if you're going to find people in the middle of a, a, a health pandemic, I, I think that is wrong because uh, there'll be many parents who have justifiable uh, concerns about the health of their children. I don't know if Elise or Richard want to come in on that. or uh... Richard. Well, I suppose if we're finishing off, I might may as well add a touch of controversy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, there aren't absolutes about this, but I, I think what I'm uh, fairly convinced about is, is that uh, if our children don't get back to school, don't get renew their education, don't do stuff to uh, cash up, that we, we're building in very long term health problems for lots of our young people, particularly those from the most deprived uh, deprived areas. So we are talking about September here. We're not talking about uh, uh, now. And from what I can see of the stats in Manchester, it, it is more like the children from more deprived uh, areas that are being kept off school. Uh, that means that the the gap is widening all, all the time and I think we have to do something about uh, about that and uh, I think uh, within reason uh, applying the law as it is is the right thing to do to make sure that we do get our children back to school. Thanks Richard and uh, one question uh, or at least did you want to come in on this one? Uh, only to say that I probably agree with uh, Sir Richard there that uh, ultimately it'll be about and in Stockport we do it well in fact in Great Manchester it's how we rock and roll and it? it's it's about how we do things together and how we work with our communities and how as a local authority we are working with our schools to put the children first and the, and the staff that are working in that school and make sure that um, those schools that know their communities the best um, and we get the best solution for the children but if if our children remain out of of school we are storing up long-term problems for, for the children and and there is there is a there is a balance to be struck there so i would say we definitely need to take a uh, balance forward we need to consider that balance carefully um and we need to work with our schools who know their communities the best to find the best way forward for them um but so that that would be what i would add to that thanks just bring andy back in on that point Thanks for putting the cat amongst the pigeons there, uh, there Ian. Um, I'm not sure we're completely disagreeing because I want kids to be back in school and we all we all do. Um, and the damage of people being out of school is, is pretty significant. But I just don't think talk of finding parents is, is the way to go. We often talk of working with people. So give the parents the data, take them through the explanations, explain why it's safe. But if there's a reason in a particular household because of a grandparent perhaps with an underlying condition and there's a concern within that, you know, I just don't think hitting parents with fines is, is going to help in many of our communities, given how tough people are finding things. So maybe there is a slight difference. I don't know. But, um, you know, I think all of us probably want this, but we do want the same thing, which is our kids back in school. And we are talking about catch up provision over the summer, opening many of our schools and seeing if we can kind of get kids back into school for sports and cultural activities. Um, so that we begin to, to help them uh, kind of catch up where, from where they've lost out. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I think we've got a final question uh, from Andy Bounds uh, at the FT, which I'm going to put to Richard first, uh, and then Kate may want to uh, come in. Uh, and apologies to those uh, colleagues who have not been able to get to their second uh, questions. Um, the question is, uh, Richard, uh, do GDPR rules prevent the publication of Pillar 2 data? So if you could take that first, if Kate's got anything to add, we'll go to Lisa and then Andy can finish. Uh, that's, uh, I've been just trying to look at uh, information on Public Health England and uh, uh, I, I can't be absolute about this, but I think uh, the question about uh, 
Alderman Rochdale, it, it appears to be the week before's data than the data we, we're using. So actually, uh, having checked that, and uh, Kate's not nodding, that uh, uh, actually our data is more up to date than uh, what was referred to, in which case it shows that the position in Oldham and Rochdale has significantly improved over uh, since that data was published uh, rather than uh, rather than worsened. Um, uh, again, this is something that uh, a question that Kate might want to talk about. Clearly, we can't publish individual data. That's absolutely uh, uh, the case. Uh, one of the issues that we have been uh, grappling with is uh, data sharing protocols and rules, because actually. Uh, again, that, that's uh, not just bureaucracy gone mad, is, is that people do have a right to a certain amount of uh, protection. What we can do uh, in terms of publication is use anonymised uh, uh, data, collective data. And uh, apart from anything else, that anonymised data is really, really important in order to be able to do analysis and research to further improve how we deal not just with COVID-19, but any other uh, outbreak that might come along as well. Yes, I, I would I would echo Sir Richard's uh, comments and we are working through with colleagues in Public Health England and nationally on GDPR. So there's uh, some very active work going on to resolve any information governance issues that need to be resolved. Uh, they've probably taken longer than I would like personally, but they are being are, are being worked through and hopefully will be resolved very quickly. And uh, thank you to our uh, wonderful uh, uh, information governance colleagues in the combined authority who are working on beha behalf of all 10 DPHs in Greater Manchester to uh, produce a speedy resolution. And again, uh, just to echo Sir Richard's comments about the data, uh, the data in the report I think being referred to, which is the uh, report on Leicester, is from the uh, 20 uh, is from the 21st to the 27th of June. So our data is actually more up to date than that. And the, uh, as Sir Richard said, there has been an improvement in terms of Rochdale's position in particular. Thanks, going to bring Elise in for any final comments. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to basically say, yeah, you know, the, this virus is still with us. We, we, we're still, it's still there. It's very much there. There are lots of us who are mourning people who um, unfortunately have died of this virus. There are many people who are really poorly because of this virus and many, many of us that are really worried about them. So I would say, remember that. Um, we've done this, we've come through this so far by pulling together and sticking to the rules and, and really looking out for each other. We need to continue to do so. And if we do that, then go out, get your hair cut now the hairdressers is open. Go and have that drink with your you know your friend or your your family member go and go and enjoy a meal somewhere as the restaurants start to open and and things start to get back to normal by all you know do that support your local shops and and support your local businesses um and 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 stick local shop local buy local but but do that remembering all the while that this virus is still with us and we're still living with it and and it hasn't gone away yet um follow the advice um that the uh, that 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 Kate's already uh, already said um, and then finally just to say you know that virus is still with us therefore there are still businesses massively affected by having this virus here who are not open who will not be able to get back up and running we need to protect people's jobs we need to find um, solutions and I'm really asking the government um, really think about how we can refresh things like the furlough other, other help they've put in place to really make sure that it is targeted where it is needed and that we're really supporting those jobs and those sectors that really need us, all our creatives, our hospitality, those sporting venues, um, the visitors, the hotels, all of these places, as well as many others, um, really need our support right now. And I would really like to see the government do something about that. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. I'll just bring in Andy to finish. Well, Thanks, uh, th thanks very much, uh, Ross. And thanks to uh, Richard, Elise uh, and Kate and to all of you for, for joining us this afternoon. We've had some great questions there and we've covered uh, a lot of important ground and I hope you found that uh, helpful. And I think some of what we've said today is quite significant uh, in, its, uh, in its implications for the, the new phase we're going into because it does feel like we're going into a new phase now in the, uh, the tackling of this virus where 
the um, the focus has shifted very much now to the to the local level, and we're we're ready to take on uh, everything that, that entails. Andy Bounds' question, I think, is a is a, a good question in that there's still way too much cautiousness, as far as I can see, with regard to sharing of data. And I, I read today, I think it was in the FT, that there was a ministerial decision not to share share data. Um, I think it's unfair sometimes that Public Health England are getting all the criticism. Um, you know, the government's got to take responsibility, so have ministers here, for getting quality information into the hands of people at local level so that we can make meaningful use of it. And, you know, I, I think ultimately it's their responsibility and GDPR uh, considerations uh, should not uh, be preventing that in the middle of a public health crisis. The, the health and safety of the the public is the um, is the highest priority, and um, you know excuses around data sharing can't really, in my view, stand in the way of, of the, the the support that needs to be provided to, to people at a local level. I, I actually have a lot of sympathy for uh, my counterpart in in, in Leicester um, or, or Richard's counterpart, more more accurately, I should say, uh, and um, everyone in the, the Leicester system because I, I don't think they've been uh, treated fairly. Um, I am very proud, though, I have to say, of Greater Manchester. You know, what, what you've heard today and the figures that we've published don't happen by accident. You know, we are working hard behind the scenes to keep on top of things. And as Richard said, outbreaks have been been managed without anybody knowing about it. So, you know, we have a lot of professionals, dedicated people uh, working hard throughout. I, I think it would be I, I really don't want to see Rochdale's name sort of pushed out there uh, after this because the figures if you look at the figures, they're all pretty much in the same range for Greater Manchester, you know, give or take, someone has to be top, but they're all pretty much in the same uh, the, the same kind of range. Um, and as we've been saying today, a, a long way from, from, from Leicester, not just geographically, but um, in terms of, of this, uh, the spread of this virus as well. So we're not complacent in any way, shape or form, um, but, you know, we, we, we have uh, a, a strong position here to defend and that's exactly what we'll be doing. Uh, over the coming weeks. So uh, thank you everybody for um, again uh, giving us your time uh, this afternoon. I hope you found that uh, briefing uh, useful. Uh, thanks to you Ross for, for moderating it and we will see you all uh, this time next week. Thanks very much.